welcome to the podcast. Uh, my name is Father Bill W., Episcopal Anglican priest here in Austin, Texas, and uh, did celebrate 50 years the other day uh, of recovery. So that was a, a major milestone. And I'm, I'm telling people that uh, what I've learned in the first 50 are going to help me a, a lot in the next 50. So uh, I'm looking forward to those. It should be a much, much smoother ride. Uh, uh, invite you to go to our website. It's titled Two Way Prayer. If you haven't checked that out, uh, and and go to the workshop section. We got a new video up there, which describes two way prayer and a bunch of handouts. Um, uh, I, I think you'll find it really interesting, and I'd love to hear your feedback on that. It's going to try to take the place of the monthly workshops I was I was doing for the last few years. We are um, now in the uh, tail at the tail end of a marvelous series uh, of uh, kind of looking at the Jungian perspective on uh, the twelve-step journey, and and my guest is uh, Dr. Ian McCabe, who is the author of Carl Jung and Alcoholics Anonymous. He uh, is a Jungian analyst clinical psychologist, uh, addiction therapist, barristers. He has more degrees than I have neuroses. So uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Overachievers Anonymous would be a good program for Ian to, uh, to look into. So, so uh, I, just, I wanna do a, a one minute review uh, because I had a sponsor who said, uh, it's very dangerous to kind of start uh, a, a step uh, think of it as a ladder. You don't start start on step 10. You, you better know one, two, three to kind of get up there. So the one minute review on this is uh, kind of look, we looked at step one, two, three as, uh, as where the ego has hit a wall. And Bill Wilson said uh, that he, he couldn't get over, under, or around. Had to go through and so that becomes steps two and three, where I make a connection with a new higher power. Don't have to understand it, uh, be in uh, alignment with it, just establish that connection. And then we do the great cleanup, and we have a whole uh, episode on that, which is steps four through nine, uh, taking responsibility, uh, looking at my shadow parts, uh, um, uh, taking ownership of my part and cleaning up, cleaning up my uh, my relationship with uh, you know if if God's really the, the director, what does my office look like? You know, because He's coming to visit. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, so clean up my side of the street. But now we get to what I think are the real fun parts of the of the uh, of the steps, and that's. Steps 10 through 12, which is now the direction phase. And this to me is uh, what I got out of the history uh, when I started studying it 30 years ago, that, that uh, you know, uh, that God actually has a plan for my life and he wants to reveal that to me uh, one day at a time. And, and, and so it becomes now more of an adventure. So 10, 11, and 12, sometimes they're called the maintenance steps. Uh, I don't like that. Uh, I, I think they're the direction steps, uh, living in a new relationship with this uh, center, higher power, uh, greater personality, goes by so, so many names. And, and they're the only steps I work today, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, and, and so we're going to dig into these. and. Uh, uh, Ian, Ian uh, I'm, I'm hoping you can spread a little Jungian light uh, onto the last three steps, and uh, welcome back. It's it's been a, it's been a fun ride with you. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good to see you again. Good. Okay. Step ten. Let's dig right in. Continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Now, Edward Edinger, a pretty famous Jungian analyst, uh, in his book Ego. An archetype writes about what he calls the ego self axis. 
And I think he's what he's focusing on there is what is the relationship between the ego and the self, the greater self, the capital S self, <clears throat> needs to be one of humility, needs to be one of teachability. Uh, it, it's, um, it's vital. And so I think um, perhaps we could say that step 10 is about watching, watching myself, seeing how I'm doing with this new relationship one day at a time, even one moment at a time. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. I would say that as we've come through steps one through nine, uh, Jung would say that comes into being, if I may quote him, that comes into being a higher point of view, a higher point of view. You might have called it watching, you might call it mindfulness. And he continues and says, we're both conscious and unconscious are represented. And in the, in the promises, it says, we will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. My belief is the application of Jungian theory is saying that the conscious connects up and listens to the unconscious. You can call it the ego part of the conscious deflates and allows the higher self to speak to it. So the ego is now listening to the higher power, the higher self. And we call this intuition. But so many synchronicities, so many coincidences happen that we begin to think, hey, maybe God is now active in our life, but this God can be the higher power, the higher consciousness, and we're listening, so we're intuitively able to handle situations what used to baffle us. And Bill confirms this when he writes, what used to be a hunch or occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. Mm -hmm. So I would say that we become mindful, we become aware, but we're not continuously on our guard. It just becomes a natural instinct to avoid conflict, to solve problems, to be in harmony with our mind, our unconscious, our higher power. And this then radiates into the world. So we avoid conflict with people, especially because we realize many people have got their own conflicts. Many people are as ill as ourselves. So there's no point in getting into an argument or a fight. So in the big book, it says we have given, given up the fighting. We have given up. The we, we stopped fighting everything and everyone. We right. had to. Right. And part, and part of our new insight is that we realize that people are just like us. They're suffering from what Bill calls the pains of growing up. And so... Recovering alcoholics realize that others are similar to themselves and are sort of interconnected. We're all interconnected on this divine human journey. So we're less likely to be as defiantly aggressive as the ego asserting itself and wanting things done its way. So the ego, by the time we get to steps uh, nine has deflated and we're coming close to having had a spiritual awakening, to having a spiritual awakening. Although some people might say, by coming into AA, we have a spiritual awakening. But steps one to nine certainly interconnect the unconscious from a Jungian's perspective with the conscious. And that involves a deflation of the ego. But my experience is that the ego does not tend to stay deflated. It tends to reinflate. And this is the purpose of step 10, to keep an eye on that little puppy. How, 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 how is it doing? I, I, uh, I noticed in my own life, if I am driving my car and I have six green lights in a row, my ego inflates. 
it's, well, finally, the universe is recognizing who the hell is behind this wheel here. And I feel like God has, like, parted the seas for Moses, you know? Give me five or six red lights, <laughs> and, and something else asserts itself. And, and so this that's what I'm trying to maybe, that's the way I work it, is, is focusing on watchfulness of, of this ego. Watch that it doesn't inflate or deflate too much, because that can be, you know, my worthlessness. I'm, I'm just a piece of scum. Uh, many of us alcoholics uh, suffer from that. And it, it is actually a form of inflation itself. W yeah. Would you, can you yeah, help us yeah, with that? Absolutely. And I would say that inflation is a natural part of our uh, struggle to deflate because we've been inflated maybe for 30, 40, 50 years. So it's not, may not go overnight. Although uh, the, 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 the craving may, may leave us, our ego is still there. But I, I think that's why it's very important, number one, to continue to come to the meetings. And the reason for people going to the meetings regularly is that if they don't, then they forget where they, where they came from. Now, I make the point on going to the meetings regularly, people often ask, Oh, you've been sober for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and congratulations again on your own sobriety, Bill. I didn't emphasize that enough. 50 years, wonderful. Why do you still need to go to meetings? And the reason Young would say is this. People will go to an evangelical meeting, as Bill did when, when he, he went with Eddie to, to the mission, and he'd get up there and go, oh, I'm skilling off drink for life, I'll never drink again, and then the next morning we know that he's, he's drunk. Now, what happened? What happens is this, we go to an evangelical meeting, we go to an AA meeting, we feel uplifted and secure that we'll never drink again. But if we don't keep coming back, we will lose that enthusiasm, that support from other people. That's, that is the one point about keeping us sober, keeping the ego deflated and listening maybe indirectly to some criticism that, that comes to the meeting. But I would also say step 10 encourages us to take personal inventory. Now, many people, I believe, take their personal inventory at night. <laughs> But I was listening to two wonderful AA speakers, and they said, no, take the personal inventory in the morning before you go out in the world, before you cross those six or eight uh, green lights. Take your personal inventory before you go into the office. Um, think about what you can do before you go into the office. Can you, can you, can you empty the tra trash can, for example, without getting, get, asking anybody else to do it? So taking a personal inventory in the morning is a bit like keep going back to the meetings. We in definitely need to be on continual watch, to be on continual mindfulness. And of course, we're human, we're going to slip up, but, I think the wonderful part of step 10 that's uh, often not, not spoken about enough is that we are, when we're wrong, we promptly admit it. Now, there is a big difference to when we first come into AA and when we're wrong, we try and think of excuses to, 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 to show how we're right, even though we're wrong. <laughs> but now we know there's such relief in promptly admitting when we're wrong, it takes the strain and stress off our lives. And I think that's a wonderful ego deflation in practice. Absolutely, absolutely. A couple, couple of points I wanted to make uh, in response is one, uh, something that my uh, first sponsor told me 50 years ago. He said, uh, Bill, when you go to a meeting, what you are doing is admitting your powerlessness and un unmanageability. And that is the important thing. If you happen to hear something that's helpful, that's lanyap. That's a, a Louisiana term. That's extra. But it is in the admission that it's helpful. Also, historically, and this, this, this is 
I found fascinating that, that uh, meetings were not the major focus in the beginning. It was prayer and meditation that the, the pioneers felt if they didn't do prayer and meditation, uh, they were in trouble. Meetings were helpful. But over the years, I think it, it's kind of like going to church. You know, going to church doesn't necessarily change you. It might be nice, uh, but it's are you really living the life? Uh, so, so a bit of a different focus there. Uh, and I think it's not a, usually a question of do I do one or the other. You try to do both. You know, you try to do both. Also, your point on the on the uh, taking uh, te step ten in the morning. Uh, someone told me in one of the original monographs of the big book, that's where it was. And they changed it to a nighttime inventory. Well, that was a great relief to me because I, at night I'm, I'm done. I, <laughs> I'm just not functioning, you know, after a certain hour I collapse. But in the morning to watch, what did I do yesterday? What needs cleaning up yesterday? How do I get ready for today, you know? And I use the four absolutes for that. I don't have a, a standard 28 checklist. Uh, point. But was I honest? Was I unselfish? And most of all, was I loving? Or, 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 or did fear uh, overtake me? Or egotism, egotism, probably better uh, in, in some way. And I'm always usually able to find something, you know, that needs correction. And so that leads to the prayer, leads to the prayer. Uh, one, of the, one of the pioneers said uh, uh, about watchfulness, taking your inventory, said, if you don't watch, you won't know what the hell to pray for. So this watchfulness of, of myself uh, is, is, is critically important uh, in maintaining this new relationship that I have with the, with the greater personality okay um all right anything else on 10 we need to i, I think then you know the thought through prayer and meditation that carl jung was very skeptical about meditation now he was right okay you're moving into 11 now you're moving into okay. 11 right okay. which yeah. is good which is i'm ready to go if you don't have anything more on 10 let's okay take okay. the plunge Sought okay. through prayer and meditation okay. to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. So Go for it, Ian. Carl Jung <laughs> was, um, he was a bit skeptical of meditation. Um, he, he was writing in the, in the 30s and he, he wrote that you can never come to yourself by building a meditation hut on top of Everest. The you mountaintop know, experience, eh? Well, I mean, it, 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 it seems like the ideal, the New Year's resolution, oh, I'll go to India, I'll go to the top of Mount Everest and I'll build a hut and then it will happen. No, right, you know, that's right. But, um, he, he was also against um, people chanting words that they didn't understand. So he he was he was actually writing against meditation in the thirties. He saw that he saw it as a threat in some way to that people might become godlike themselves that they couldn't handle it. Now I think as he would have approached the sixties, although he died in the early sixties, that meditation became popular through the Maharishi and the Beatles and Dam Ras bringing it. He might have changed his mind, and to a certain extent. Uh, he has written one or two complimentary points about it, but uh, how meditation has changed from uh, seeing it as, as as very esoteric and way out there to common practice today. But I think Bill Wilson was ahead of his time by bringing in this meditation aspect into the 11th step because it wasn't as popular. And that's why I'd say about uh, Bill, he, he really was a trailblazer. Um, so interestingly- there's, also a calming, there's a calming effect to meditation, various techniques, but perhaps all might, might agree that there is a, a slowing down, uh, a centering 
which, which is important and helpful. And sometimes, you know, I can recognize it in others, particularly if I'm making a mad dash to catch a plane and I'm going through uh, the, the, the area and I don't know what gate I have to go to and I approach somebody and I'm pretty frazzled and I say, eh, what gate is going to uh, such and such? And they calmly go, if you go and take the right hand turn, you will end at the correct gate and it's only five yards away. I'm startled, I go, oh my God, I see how frazzled and uptight I am, and this person is so calm. And I look at them and I'd like to say, bet you practice meditation, because some people who do practice meditation will have an aura of calm about them. And it's not the false calm we see of uh, some people who put on the, what I call the social welfare smile, and oh, I'm so happy and life is great because I'm meditating. No, they, it becomes a part of us that we can stop and think. And even when I'm frazzled like that in the airport, I go, what does it really matter? What does it really matter? And that's the question, that's the question I ask myself as to how, how over excited I might get about anything. How important is it in the grand scheme of things? And that's what meditation does, it brings us home. I hear a lot of people saying it brings us home where they feel centered in their busy, busy day. So, so through- uh, That's, a, well, I'm gonna do a, a series uh, sometime this year on uh, that, that can be helpful. I was thinking, Ian, when, when you were speaking, uh, in most major airports, uh, they have a chapel. Not very well uh, attended. <laughs> you know, if you ever can't find a seat, you can always go to the chapel and, uh, and be restored to sanity. You know, uh, find that center that you've lost. I mean, God, I know what you're talking about when the, when the, when the, unconscious kind of takes over uh, a shadow part within me. Uh, I think I spoke about Atlas, you know, uh, I've got to run the world. And when this part is running the world, it's also running over people. And it's a form of madness that has taken over me. Uh, it's not that I am frazzled or, or, or angry or rageful. Uh, it's ragefulness has me. Ragefulness has taken over me. And I need to, to look at that and I need to pray about that. I need to get that relationship right once again. And uh, it's, it's a letting go. Uh, it's a letting go of egotism, of, of puffed upness that... Um, like you say, it used to take several weeks. Hopefully, uh, we, we get a little better at it as we, as we go along. And Carl Jung does, when you say it has us, Carl Jung says the complex, and he used the word complex meaning neurosis. Yes. Neurosis has us. We don't have it. Yeah. It controls us. So what we're, tr we're trying to do is to look at the neurosis in our unconscious and get in touch with our unconscious so our conscious can have some control or harmony with it. And just, just in another point that uh, in relation to, to Young, I don't like to criticize him too much at all because I have very- Well, he's not around, so he, we, we can get away with it. <laughs> I, I, I have very many Jungian friends who, who, um, who absolutely adore him and he's beyond criticism for some, but- um, Jung does say meditation increases concentration and mm. his purpose, he said at one stage, is to shield the conscious from the unconscious and to suppress it. Now, this is a total blasphemy of what we know of meditation today, because we do understand that when we're meditating, thoughts arise and they arise spontaneously from the unconscious to the conscious and the conscious lets them in. So I think Carl Jung had the wrong end of the stick in the early thirties and may have changed his mind, but yeah. absolutely um, consciousness does calm us. 
and can help us through many, many difficult situations. And now we know a lot more about uh, brain chemistry and, and, and brain uh, geography, particularly the left brain and the right brain. And the left brain is, is very analytical and organized and, and methodical. The right brain is more intuitive, spiritual. Uh, and, and I, I mean, over the years, what I've kind of, it's always like I'm, I'm doing an adjustment in my morning meditation. Okay, left brain, we're going to quiet you for a while. And we're going to allow a, a, a switch, a transition over to the right brain, which I don't pay enough attention to, and allow it to bubble up and surface. Does, that, does that make sense? Of course. And we would say the right brain is where the intuition comes. Yes. And the logic may be on the left-hand side. And we yeah. allow, because our Western society is orientated towards logic. Uh, we, we, we tend to ignore the intuitive and indeed laugh at some of the in, intuitive ideas that are outside of the box. And, um, but Jung, just the final word on, on, on Jung, he did actually say that meditation in the Ignatian sense, and maybe you could elaborate on this for me, Bill, is uh, a word used meditation, but it's something very different to the Eastern meditation. Yes. Maybe you of experience being well uh, i was in the jesuits i was training to be a priest uh, i was alcoholic at the time and that did kind of get in the way so <laughs> but i did go through the ignatian 30-day retreat the uh spiritual exercises and and what is behind that is five five hours of meditation at different times during the day and and one of them probably the best one was you would wake up in the middle of the night and go to the chapel and do do an hours of meditation at that point. Uh, and that was when, oh my gosh, uh, really, really uh, strange encounters of the third kind were happening with me. But it was the use of imagination in prayer. I mean, when you talk about Ignatian spirituality, one of the big components is, and some say Ignatius, was uh, was the founder of the Jesuits was uh, was one of the first psychologists that 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 there is a place for imagination. Don't discount it. Don't throw it away. So if you are, uh, we just went through the Christmas uh, season. Imagine yourself in the cave or in the stable or wherever it may have been. Ima get the smell. What is the smell of uh, of the animals? So it was, it was like, uh, participate in it. Um, and and this, this is definitely right brain stuff, you know, that you're allowing yourself the freedom to not be earthbound. And this is the thing that addicts, I think, really need to uh, pay attention to because one of the things that alcohol or drugs does for us is it allows us to escape from the prison, but it kills us. <laughs> you go from the prison to the execution room. <laughs> Not a good plan. Uh, is, there, are, is there another way? And that's where I also say, I mean, because uh, sometimes, and I'm, I'm for meetings and all that sort of stuff, but my, my experience is we have substituted meetings for spiritual growth. And that's a real danger. And so just going to meetings, and just repeating and babbling the same stuff over and over again. It may keep you from drinking, but I don't think it's going to get you growing. And this is where I think Jung comes in and spiritual growth comes in. That, that, um, and, and, and Wilson was on top of this. He said, AA is a spiritual kindergarten. Don't stay in kindergarten. Get out there and, 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 and experience these other things. And that's, that, to me, that's, that's the infinite growth that 10, 11, and 12 are offering to us. So try on these forms. Uh, this, this, may, this form of meditation may be helpful for you. It may not. Uh, this kind of experience, going to a chapel at an airport, may be helpful to you. 
uh, going out in the park may be better for someone else. But you need to connect. Because uh, I mean, that, I think, we would all agree on. That that's just something <clears throat> sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact. I want to talk to you about conscious contact. What, what does that mean for you as a psychologist, as a Jungian, and as a student of AA? Conscious contact. Yeah, I would just like to say you've said, you've said a lot there, but in the, in, the defense, <laughs> in, the, in the defense of the meetings. I'm not against them. I'm not against uh, them. I'm, but, uh, but yeah, hear me most, on that. I'm not against most, them. That's fine. Most people would say that no matter how boring or repetitive they've heard people telling their same story, they seem to get something out of it. And I'm a great believer in when two or more are joined together in my name, there am I. So it's the person can have an individual experience in AA and the I honestly believe the Holy Ghost comes into the meeting and gives people now. As well, now far, we're getting down to it, Ian. This is good. This is good. <laughs> as, go, go as, for it. Go. As as for, um, so so in the meeting in the meeting, uh, the, the, there is. I, I'm, what I'm hearing you say that there is a transformation of consciousness that can happen just by being in in union with other, others like yourself, am I, am I right? Yes, yeah. and, and maybe even go a little bit further and say mm -hmm. God will prompt us and tell us what we need to do. And I think a lot of people in AA are, um, what Carl Jung would actually say is they may not be aware that they're praying in a different modality. Carl Jung said that instead of just doing a child's prayer to a loving father with the big beard, that the actual responsible living that the alcoholic, former alcohol, formerly active alcoholic is now doing is actually fulfilling, according to Jung, the divine love in us will be our form of worship of a communication with God. So it's our active everyday life that is our right. prayer to God. And I think AA people are more responsible in their everyday work. They bring the spirit of the AA into their work with them, with their ego deflation, with their anxiousness not to get in conflict, conflict with people. And they have a consciousness about this, although they may not call it prayer and they may not call it meditation. I think they are evolving from the source of the meetings. So I would argue that the meetings give them the base to go out into the world to, to cooperate, contribute more to the world. And that is their prayer to God. It's recognition of they are now being the people they were intended to be as, as, as a part of society rather than being apart from it. And, and what role would you say the morning quiet time has for that? Because as I listen to you, I see it as, as very similar. You know, do I, am, I, am, am I spending an hour in, in reflection, in reading, in prayer, in meditation, in examination each morning to be watchful of myself and then carry that out into the world? It's very similar, is it not? Yes, ab absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And just, um, I've been very critical of Young, but I will just give his final reflection. <laughs> he actually said, this, and, and he did write contradictory things, but I think this is important. He actually wrote that we're free to spend the time listening to the wireless. He, he used the word wireless, of course, and rushing off to the cinema. Uh -huh. And he says, but neurosis is coming from the fact that we don't have enough time for ourselves yeah and then he says it would be wiser and here's the contradiction it would be wiser to meditate and to seek to fill the void with meditation mm. and that we need rest rather to to run 
after distractions. So now he's saying there is some usefulness for meditation. <laughs> Right, right. I remember, I remember a funny story uh, that uh, a patient told um, where, where Jung had, had said to him, uh, go and, and spend the time by yourself. All right, spend that time by yourself, exactly what you were saying. Uh, and, and he comes back next week and he says, well, what did you do with the time? He says, well, I listened to a Mozart concert and, and I, I, I read Dante's um, Divine Comedy. No, no, no! You did not spend the time with yourself. If, you know, how the hell do you expect us to spend time with you? <laughs> yes. Very yes. difficult. To, it's very difficult. Um, and addicts and alcoholics, God, we have such a hard time with prayer and meditation. You know, so I, I think if you just kind of chop it up into little pieces, you know, spend five minutes in, uh, you know. Right. Well, yeah. I encourage, I encourage uh, people to do seven minutes listening to. Seven minutes. <laughs> water it into 20 minutes because they may not have yeah. time. For that, maybe seven minutes at, at night. And God cuts us addicts a little slack, you know. <laughs> But um, the fact that he's writing this in the in the thirties, so through yeah. prayer and meditation, to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out, and um, I, I think that 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 was ter terribly terribly advanced for him to introduce meditation to uh, AA. And yeah. I would say way ahead of his time on lots of things was our bill. <laughs> yes. Uh, now, I, I, there's, a, there's a quote you have in your, in your book. I think it's on step 12. Yeah. So it was talking about uh, um, this encounter of the ego with the self. And you quote Jung comparing this encounter to that of, I quote, iron being forged between the hammer and an anvil. I read somewhere else where, where Jung said, uh, for, uh, for the, the ego, an encounter with the self is always in the form of kind of a defeat. So it's, it's, the, it's that right relationship, getting in right relationship with this greater part of me. Um, Robert Johnson has a lovely phrase, um, when his ego, when his ego would reinflate, he would say, "I am sent back to boil in the oil of transformation." I have this image of a pot in the jungle, and he he went out and his ego inflated, but it needs more humility, so he's sent back to boil a little bit more. So pain and struggle and this whole spiritual journey. I mean, it's not just, um, maybe this is what Jung was getting at when you were quoting about, you know, get off the mountaintop, fella, you know? Uh, the work is down here in the valley. How are you doing after the meeting? How, 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 how are you doing in your relationship with your, with your spouse? How are you doing in, in your honesty at your work? You know, those are areas that we need to look at. Yes. You know, and, and we find defeat there. And the anvil and the hammer is, is a good analogy yeah. because similarly with um, alchemy, the stone has got to be burnt down to its basics and reddened, and that takes pain. But a much gentler method I've been reading in Freemasonry, and I'm not a Freemason, by the way, but I, I like their philosophy, which is you take the rough stone mm. and you grind it down gradually and slowly till it becomes smooth. You smooth it out. So the, the anvil and the hammer is that it is so difficult to face up to ourselves in, a, in the fourth st step, even more difficult in the fifth step to acknowledge our defects of character to another. And then having to go to make amends to people. Of course, this is terribly hard work. So the, the anvil and the hammer is, is quite apt because it's tough 
it's tough work and the ego has been hammered, hammered into position and lessened. And this is the inflated ego of the alcoholic, which is inflated through the, you could call it the oxygen of alcohol to deflate and to come to a stage in step 10, for example, where it can admit freely that it's wrong to have done certain things. And when we're wrong, promptly admitted it. This really is egoflation of debt. Yeah, and doesn't life with a capital L have a way of doing that to us? And this is this, back to your second half of life that in the first half of life, you build up an ego. And you know you have to do that, but then in the second half of life the rules change, and and, and life has a way of uh, um, inflicting um, I, I don't know pain maybe uh, difficult lessons. Let me put it that way. And if if one believes, if one believes, and I'm not totally gone on this, that God has a design for us. Mm. I would have difficulty with this myself. Then we're going to experience massive frustrations if we're on the wrong, if we're on the, if we're on the wrong path. And Jung says, Jung himself writes that he said, from the beginning, I had a sense of destiny. Mm. As though my life was assigned to me by fate and had to be fulfilled. Now he doesn't say that God has given him this, this, this uh, mission. Nobody could rob me of this conviction that I was enjoined upon me to do what now he mentions God, what God wanted and not what I wanted, that what God wanted and not what I wanted that gave me the strength to go my own way. Now, this really is the essence of the ego inflated saying, I want to, I want to be a professional gambler. Right. And Inflated ego say, well, actually, God wants you to be a surgeon. You've got the skills. And the inflated ego say, well, look at my my fingers are so deft at playing cards. <laughs> well, you got you got long fingers, so you can go into uh, into heart surgery or whatever. So, I think the fulfilling of God's plan for us and going along with it and not saying, oh yeah, he's got a plan at nine o'clock in the morning to take this exam and I've got to pass it, etc." But just this feeling that there is a vocation for each of us, that everybody's got a calling that they're good at. And if they get in touch with this calling and then their lives will flow much easier. Um, from an economic point of view, if people did the job they liked, the economy would be much more benefited simply because there are people in jobs that they dislike and they're detracting from the economy. I'm probably going off now from psychology into economics. No, no, it's good. It's good. Follow our heart in our vocation. Then we will lead a much, uh, a much happier and contented and harmonious life. And how do we know our vocation? That's what I say would come from the unconscious by listening to the unconscious will tell us what to do. And the word vocation comes from a calling as though outside of ourselves, we hear the voice telling us what to do. And I think this is what happens to some people in AA who even though they may be in their midlife will change careers to follow their true leaning, to follow their vocation. And it's, it's, it's not that they have to become priests or ministers, but if they want to change to a trade that they're good at, that is part of their natural ability, then they're listening and they're opening up to that. And it is remarkable how many people return to further education in, in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Or even as an avocation, uh, I, might, I might keep the day job, but, yes. but on the side, doing the things I love, doing the things I feel called to do. Yeah. And, and having, you know, having a family is, to me, is, that in itself is, is, is a vocation. And, and, and uh, you know, working at it quite well to ensure that our children are, are given the very best that we can give, much better than when we were drinking. Um, 
Yeah, and to me, this is where the two-way prayer is so so very, very helpful, that I start listening uh, to these deeper parts of myself, which, which knows what is good for me and wants to direct me in some way. Uh, and that's what I heard you saying with your wonderful analogy about, about the, the yolk and the white in the egg. The, I'm in, I'm in dialogue, or I should be in dialogue with this greater self because it has messages, information, guidance for me. And, and that's what leads to a, a, a new form of consciousness, an intuition. Uh, it doesn't feel right, or this feels so right. Um, and, you know, I, I thought of, uh, what's his name, uh, Joseph Campbell, when you were speaking, to follow your bliss, find out what your bliss is, you know, and, and then begin to follow that. It doesn't mean you quit the day job. It certainly doesn't mean you leave your wife and four kids and go to a monastery. You know, that mm -hmm. is not God's will. But finding out what God's will is 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 <clears throat> really at the basis of this uh and maybe the word god needs to be uh uh put away for quite a while i, I think it does we've contaminated yeah. it terribly at least the jewish people are smart enough to say Absolutely. don't even mention the word we <laughs> it's too holy you know oh. it's too holy uh so we follow the name hashem hashem and I, I must say, in many meditation groups I attend, and two-way two -way prayer groups, there are many Jewish people because they've been um, trained almost to have direct contact with yeah. their power, and uh, they're they're open to to to, me to meditation and listening to what um, the unconscious is saying. But I do think that on the twelve step, having had a spiritual awakening, not going to have one, but having had a spiritual. Right as a result of working the steps and um, we try to carry the message to other alcoholics and practice these principles in all our affairs i think that sums it up that we're going to be active in, in in the principles in all our affairs that includes work our, our, our home life etc and there will be vocational aspect that by Carrying the message to other alcoholics, of course, we're going to reinforce our own sobriety, but we're listening, we're spiritually awake. We don't, we don't actually use that term, hey, I'm awake, <laughs> I'm spiritually awake, but we've had a spiritual awakening as a result of working the steps. Right. And it's of the, what uh, William James calls, of the educational variety. Spiritual awakening doesn't have to be like Bill having... The, 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 the flash of, the, of the, the air coming in through the window. It can be a gradual process. But for me, it would be that the conscious is now listening to the unconscious, that they're connected. And from a Jungian perspective, this is the result of the individuation process. So you can go into a Jungian analysis and pay several thousand pounds a year for 10 years, and you become maybe individuated, but quiet word on the side, you probably will get similar benefits <laughs> almost any 12-step program that works you through the steps, because the end result is a communication between the conscious and the unconscious, and of course, how this can happen is just listening to dreams, active imagination, two-way prayer meetings are very, very effective in being humble and deflated enough to allow other people to listen to our prayers and to listen in particular to the response that is given in the two-way two -way prayer process. I think, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, but I think for Jung, uh, the goal is not holiness on top of mountain, but wholeness, wholeness of the self, which, which um, in, entails taking ownership of my past, of my shadow, of um, a lot of the things I don't want to look at. Uh, there was a Episcopal priest, you quote him in your book, actually, John Sanford, um, where he said, uh, 
God loves our shadow more than ourselves because it's more real, you know, it's more honest. So we got a lot of darkness in us. Okay, let's share that. Let's own that. Let's uh, allow that to be transformed. That's the journey, okay? not to push it down into the basement again, but to let it out into the light. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's where so, change happens. So that it's progress, not perfection. So even yeah. after spiritual awakening, we still have work to do with, with, on ourselves. We still have our defects of character, as they say, the horse thief without the alcohol is still a horse thief, but hopefully is not stealing horses. Right. The, 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 the um, process that brought him or her to steal horses in the first place still needs smoothing out. And able to laugh at ourselves, uh, you know, uh, and, or cry. <laughs> I guess you could, you, you know, uh, e e e either one, uh, but this is who we are and, uh, and we are loved. And the, the big lesson I think is to learn to love ourselves. And also yeah. by loving ourselves, we can love others. By accepting ah, right. imperfections, we can accept the imperfections in others. I often think that even when I gossip about somebody else, I'm trying to take the spotlight off my own imperfections and my own uh, impure thoughts or whatever is going on. So we become more tolerant and realize that we're all part of the human race. And Jung would be very big on this, calling it unus mundus, that we are all sharing a common humanity, that we are all, the analogy I gave the Atlantic Ocean, where it can be a separate little drop that's pulled out, but we're also part of this common ocean of humanity. And that reminds me of one more point I, I wanted to make before we close. And that is that Jung believed my work makes a difference. Whether I do this or not matters not only to me, but to the world. I'm delighted that you brought that point up because I'm going to read, take just for a moment, that he says just when you're working with one particular patient, it may seem quite insignificant. When one alcoholic becomes sober, it may seem insignificant. And it may be for himself as well as his own soul. But he says that this person who becomes sober is laying an infinitesimal grain of sand in the scale of humanity's soul. So this one person is bringing the whole of humanity forward by a small grain. And it's by this improvement, if we have millions of people making the improvement, then humanity as a whole improves. And he does say, small and invisible as this contribution may be, it is yet an opus magnum. And it is, he says, the ultimate questions of psychotherapy. Opus magnum means the great work. <laughs> the great work, the great work. And that the ultimate questions of psychotherapy are not a private matter. They represent a supreme responsibility. So it is, it is the, the person getting sober may think it's just for themselves, but they're contributing to the magnus opus, the great work of humanity, of improving the whole world. And, you know, as I said at the beginning, to go back to God and maybe by doing so we improve God. That's a heresy, but however. Well, um, I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. <laughs> I don't think God is some unchangeable, unmoving uh, being. I think he is being with a capital B and is in relationship to us. And it makes a difference whether we do our work. It makes a difference to God. Uh, that's Jung's answer to Job, which I would really encourage people to read, and and particularly Edinger's commentary on mm -hmm. that. I'll put those in the in in the um, show notes. Uh, I've read each of them four or five times because it's very deep stuff, 
and it is quite heretical, but um, <laughs> off we go. <laughs> we are hoping to improve God. Yes, it does sound <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. It makes sense yeah. If, we're, if we're a part of God and we improve, however infinitesimally small, then we're helping to create the greater, the greater good, the greater work, and can return to God saying, well, I tried a little bit to improve you. Let That's me, right. Let, well, we're in this me, thing together. Me, we're in me, this thing together. It's a, a very different, a different attitude. Well, listen, uh, we have burned up our hour, and uh, and I can't afford these uh, the prices you charge, Ian. So I'm going to have to go to a meeting, so <laughs> and get it elsewhere. Uh, but this has been a, a marvelous, marvelous journey through the twelve steps. I think we we approached it in a different way uh, than maybe the, the normal route. Uh, but I think it has some deeper layers that can be very, very helpful to, to people. So I thank you once again for leading us on this journey. And I thank you guys for listening. Hope you found it helpful. Uh, hope my bishop isn't, lead, isn't listening because uh, I'm a heretic, but uh, I'm a recovering heretic. So uh, I keep coming back. So, <laughs> so thanks for joining us. Uh, We'll do something else next week and off we go. Thank you, Ian.